so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the dairy stuff that we've been doing, uh, present some of the data that uh, uh, we've been collecting over the past few years. Uh, I know Eric maybe talked a little bit about uh, some of that, but I'll go maybe into a little more depth uh, on what, what we've done and maybe some look into the future, some other projects. So like Mike said, we've got a, a two herds here, an organic herd and a conventional herd, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll discuss some of that uh, in, in the, a little bit. But it's a very unique situation here at, at Morris. We're the only uh, land-grant institution that has an organic and a conventional herd side-by-side -side available for, for doing that research. It just doesn't exist anywhere else in, in the United States. So our existing dairy, uh, we milk about 250 cows twice a day. Um, it's typical of a mid-sized uh, Minnesota dairy farm. Uh, we have the or organic herd here on the left. Um, we produce about 12,000 pounds uh, of milk per day. So to get that in gallons, divide by about eight and a half. Uh, we produce a little bit more conventional milk than organic, uh, just because they're fed a little bit differently. The organic cows are, are more on pasture. But our, our system here that we'll talk about is our, our dairy. It was an old tie stall facility, so it's typical. There's a Midwestern dairy. There's still a lot of cows milked in tie stall barns uh, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, all over yet. And uh, this is where we uh, have milked our cows and we'll be talking about some of the energy uh, things that we've done there. So this is our uh, existing dairy, uh, our, our barn. Uh, out back has a existing uh, manure lagoon, storage of uh, over a million gallons of liquid waste. Uh, we have two bulk tanks, uh, so milk storage tanks, where we're able to store milk for our, our organic herd and our conventional herd. Uh, we'll talk about some of that data. Pretty typical uh, automatic washing system uh, where the, the lines are washed after every milking and sanitized and where we go through a lot of water per day. And then uh, some newer improvements that we've made on the outside uh, of the barn are, are these uh, solar panels. And we'll see them in, in a tour in, in a little bit. Sort of an orientation, we've also uh, saw some new solar installations. So our way up here, I guess, is our dairy facility. And we've interconnected some of these uh, 50 kilowatt solar arrays uh, that was just came online uh, over by our calves and you can see the swine barns uh, that we'll talk about tomorrow with some solar panels on them as well and then there's a newer solar facility here but we're uh, all trying to tie that back into the into the dairy where we've uh, i think eric maybe have talked about some new uh, wind installations uh, that that we've had and we'll uh, discuss more of those when when we go on the tour but sort of a a layout of what, what's happening on our dairy and some of the improvements uh, that we've made because of the, of the data that we're going to show. So milking our cows is very energy intensive. Um, we use uh, about 440 kilowatt hours per cow per year. Um, so it's uh, quite extensive for, for our dairy. We're using about 21 therms of natural gas per cow per year. Um, so about uh, $11 per day in uh, natural gas, mostly for furnace and a water heater uh, to, to heat the water for washing. And we go through about 220,000 gallons of uh, hot water per year. So 900 gallons uh, per cow per year. So we use uh, a lot of water uh, for the dairy system. That's mostly for washing uh, milk lines pipelines, um, um, different things using water, towels, uh, doesn't include drinking water. Uh, it's mostly for just milking the cows. So a few years ago, we decided, uh, we, we started on our uh, green of, greening of agriculture project to basically conduct a baseline energy audit uh, of our dairy. Uh, we had really no clue what uh, our dairy was using for, for energy uh, or for water usage. And I think some of the results uh, maybe surprised all of us in, in what we found when we started collecting this information. And then we 
So we, we have the, the baseline energy uh, information of our dairy facility, and then we wanted to develop and optimize those systems um, based on what, what we saw before. So that includes uh, some of the solar in installations and the new uh, wind turbines uh, that we've installed. And then as Joel talked about, uh, we wanted to conduct uh, life cycle assessment in our dairy production system. So those were our, our main three goals. So when we uh, monitored our, our energy system, so we had a, a lot of data loggers in our, in our dairy barn, a huge uh, uh, amount of sensors where they monitor uh, every 10 seconds uh, and they calculate an average and store that data. So there uh, were 11 water temperatures and, and flow sensors, so we can measure a, a lot of water. We had air temperature sensors, and then we were trying to measure electric currents on over 20 uh, different processes in our dairy barn. So in a sense, we, we collect a lot of big data uh, per, per year. So in our, in our dairy, we have two different uh, production systems. We have two different um, bulk tanks for holding our milk. On the left is a scroll compressor that uh, is a newer tank uh, used for our organic herd. We only uh, started our organic herd in 2010, so that's a relatively newer compressor. And uh, the old reciprocating compressor, which is seen on a lot of dairy farms in, in Minnesota, uh, this one is, I'm not sure, 25 years uh, or older. Um, um, so, we have a good comparison for monitoring the, the energy usage on, on those two compressors. And basically we can see this uh, blue line up here is our uh, conventional compressor our, or the, the reciprocating one. And the bottom here, oh, we, we need a new pointer, huh? <laughs> and then we can use the, uh, the uh, organic compressor or the scroll compressor, which is this line here. So you can see that there's a about a 32% reduction in, in energy usage by just having a new compressor. And we use a lot less uh, kilowatt hours per 100 pounds of milk. So when we get that, definitely we can see a, a great reduction in, in <coughs> terms, even some small uh, improvements in, in, in dairy uh, efficiency by having those comparisons. Uh, we have a um, variable frequency drive on our uh, vacuum pump. So basically, there are a lot of dairies in Minnesota that have uh, vacuum pumps that, that run at full speed. Uh, I grew up on one of those farms where you, uh, the, you turn the motor on and it runs at high speed uh, all through milking. But a lot of dairies are starting to put in very variable frequency drives to help reduce that energy load. It doesn't need to be running at full speed at all times. So you can see what happens when we, so we're, uh, cruising along here with our old vacuum pump, uh, sort of uh, energy usage, and then when we put the frequency drive in, we uh, reduce the energy uh, quite considerably uh, when we put that uh, frequency drive in. These are some calculations I think that Eric had. Uh, our motor is about seven and a half horse. Our VFD cost us about $3,400 to, to put on. And we're actually saving about four dollars per day by having that frequency drive in. The payback here, two and a half years <laughs> uh, to make that work. So we installed this in September of uh, 2013, and we've we've had our payback by then. Yes. What's the daily pump run time? What is the daily pump run time? We are running. Uh, if you if you count all the washing and milking that we do, our pump is probably running. 18 hours a day. So it's uh, that's a pretty considerable energy savings if we're running at that, that amount of time. If we look at uh, hot water usage, this is when we first started uh, monitoring um, our dairy. Our water usage kind of has its ups and downs. So uh, you can see the different things that we have, we have a wash tank, so this is for washing our pipeline. We use a pressure washer to, to clean our milking parlor uh, after we're done milking, so we take a lot of water to, to clean that. Uh, we have some 
bulk tank washes and uh, machine washes um, for washing towels. So we use towels to clean our cows. So we have some different spikes here, five or six o'clock in the morning. This is when uh, um, the system kicks on automatically to sanitize uh, before the, the milkers get here. Uh, so we can start milking cows. Uh, milk truck might show up as well, six o'clock in the morning to pick up, pick up some milk. So we're using uh, a lot more hot water. And that goes down, we maybe do some washing of our towels halfway through milking. But you can see when we get done milking, about 11 o'clock in the morning, we start washing our parlor and trying to wash the pipeline at the same time. So we, in a sense, really run out of hot water uh, because we use uh, a lot during that, that time period. And then in the afternoon here, this is a, a second sort of sanitized, getting ready for the evening milking. And then it sort of repeats the cycle all over again for the evening milking. So we, we have uh, differences in flow rates across our, our different milking times, uh, at least when we're milking twice a day. This is our, our monthly uh, water usage uh, when, when we started. Uh, this project, we were running about 1,100 gallons of water per day. Um, hot water, somewhere in that for 350 to 400 gallons uh, per day. So quite, quite considerable amount of, of water. And over time, uh, we, we maybe have increased the amount of, of water that we use. We may have milked a few more cows, um, but we sort of go in, in streaks of, of hot water usage. In the winter time, we don't use as much hot water in the winter time, we're probably milking less cows during that time period. We're sort of a two seasonal dairy herd. So we, we are probably our lowest in cow numbers over the winter time. But then about now and into July, we're probably milking our most cows because of our pasture-based system. So we use a lot more water uh, for milking, washing, cleaning up uh, than what we do in, in other times of the year. And our hot water usage goes up maybe around 450 gallons uh, per year. Some of the other ones are, are maybe not quite as significant. Pressure washer and the uh, wash sink use about 200 per uh, year uh, on average, or 200 per month. And uh, some of the other bulk tank washers are uh, a little bit lower than that. This is what our electricity average looks like uh, across the year. It's kind of uh, all over the place. This purple one up here, this top one that uses the most energy per day is our conventional compressor. So our reciprocating compressor using the most energy per day uh, on our dairy. So it's really not very efficient uh, to have that old compressor. Ventilation is the next one. So our ventilation goes up. We're using more fans uh, to keep uh, our workers and cows more comfortable uh, during while we're milking cows. So ventilation goes up uh, in the summertime because of heat, not so much in the winter time. One big thing that uh, we like to notice is this green line. It spikes in the winter, it goes down in the spring, sort of flat lines, and then goes back up again. Is an uh, electric heater that we'll talk about in a second. But for the most part, all these other uh, pressure washers and uh, organic compressors and things are right around that 25 or 30 kilowatt hours per day. So remember that uh, electric uh, spike that I that I showed you earlier. So this what happened. This is when we when we first started monitoring it. But I think the the question was what was going on in about November 11th in 2014. Uh, our kilowatt hours per day were right around 175 maybe, and then they almost doubled uh, in uh, energy usage. Well, oops. there's a lot of dairy farms in Minnesota that put these milk house heaters in their barns so they don't freeze the pipes, freeze the water pipes. You wanna keep pipes from unfreezing, so you put those in there, 
and your energy usage doubles just by a, I don't know, $40 milk house heater that goes into, into the barn. So I think we need to figure out ways to reduce the usage of these space heaters. So if you people have space heaters in your office, this is how much energy you're using. You're doubling the energy usage by using a space heater. Um, so one of the things that we, we really didn't know about when, when we were started this project is how much energy we were actually using on our dairy because it just, when it gets cold, we just plug the space heater in because we don't want to freeze everything. So, but now we know that we're uh, utilizing a lot of energy by using those space heaters and we should look at different ways to uh, alleviate those problems. So our, our yearly uh, electricity, we can see in 2014, uh, doing pretty good. Oh, yep, we still use the space heater um, to uh, unfreeze our pipes. Uh, we haven't quite figured out a way to not use that yet. Uh, so our, our energy usage does spike uh, quite significantly uh, because of that space heater. And it's actually the most consuming energy device at our dairy uh, during the winter months. Again, uh, about the same, uh, the, the heaters uh, spike. Most of these other things are our are, are, are conventional uh, compressor, so I wanted to change two things about the dairy. We would change our, our compressor and our space heaters. Those are consuming the most amount of energy. So if we look at all of the total energy usage in our, in our dairy parlor, so this is gas plus electric heat. Uh, most of it <coughs> is coming from milking parlor heat, so that's uh, basically to heat workers, to heat the milking parlor. Uh, during the winter time, uh, when we're milking cows, water heating is the, is the second most, so trying to heat the water so we can wash uh, all of our, our equipment and wash down the parlor after milking. <coughs> Milk cooling is about 10%, so uh, that's uh, the second, third most uh, highest energy usage. And there's other things that are sort of uh, intermediate here, not very much on some of the heaters, washer dryers, things like that. So if you, if you sort of break it down by electricity uh, usage, um, we use milk cooling is, is the number one sort of uh, consumer of energy usage. So that's for our two bulk tanks. So we have to keep the milk cool consistently at 38, 39 degrees. Uh, so, and we have to get that milk cool from the cow uh, to 38 degrees within a few hours after milking. So it takes a lot of energy to cool that milk. Uh, about 10% for the, the vacuum pump. Again, ventilation uh, does consume a lot of, of energy for our dairy. You know, we, we have lights. Uh, there's a lot of miscellaneous things that we really don't account for. Um, some of these include our, our barn cleaner. So we have a barn cleaner that, that cleans the manure that runs into the lagoon. Uh, we have uh, some other experiments that go on out there. Uh, just some lights in our tie stall barn. Uh, our cow vacuum, different things like that, that don't measure a lot of indi uh, electricity individually, but when you start to total it up, it, it accounts for a lot of miscellaneous factors. In 2016, uh, energy usage is about, about the same. So we're at 290 in 2015, about 300 in 2016, and things are about the same. Most of the energy is coming from milk cooling, and ventilation, vacuum pump about 10%, and uh, heaters in the parlor, and uh, space heaters about 15%. This is our, our total hot water usage for the day. We use, again, about 600 gallons total uh, per day. Most of that is coming from sanitizing our equipment. So this is washing after milking or sanitizing before we start milking. And then we use about 40% of the hot water to clean the parlor. So our pressure washer to wash down the parlor after we're done milking. So those are the two things that, that utilize the most water, hot water, 
and we're trying to do these at the same time. Uh, so that creates some issues with running out of hot water because we're trying to wash the parlor and sanitize and clean the equipment at the same time. In 2016, uh, about the same, well, we're sanitizing equipment at 46. Now we may be using a little bit more. Obviously these fluctuate depending on the year, depending on how many cows we have, uh, how much time we spend cleaning up. Uh, but we're using about the same, most of the hot water is being used to sanitize equipment uh, in our balcony parlor. So these are the, sort of wanted to compare some differences between uh, months, maybe winter months and summer months. Um, in the winter, between winter and summer, we're still using a lot, most of the energy for sanitizing equipment. Parlor cleaning is maybe a little bit more in the winter time. Things are cold, things are frozen, and it takes a little bit longer to get everything clean. So we spend maybe a little bit more hot water usage in the winter time uh, for cleaning uh, than we do in the summertime. Uh, but again, uh, we use uh, maybe a little bit more hot water in the winter, 520 gallons versus 420 gallons uh, per day in, in the summer. So this is what our, our energy fluctuation sort of looks like. Uh, basically our, our water usage, again, what I've showed, goes up uh, in the summer months when we're, we seem to have a, a few more cows and our energy usage goes down uh, because we're, we're the winter time, we have a lot of ventilation uh, in our milking parlor. Electricity, so these are uh, basically some of our, our averages. Um, if we look at the natural gas, these are our totals that we, we had in 2015 using about 6.7 megajoules of natural gas per cow per day, uh, 1.3 kilowatt hours per cow per day, and uh, about six, a little bit shy of seven gallons of total water per cow per day. Last few slides here. Uh, well, we I, I talked about in, in, in January. Again, uh, we use more hot water, about 1.62 gallons per cow per day in the winter time, and only about a gallon per cow uh, in in the summertime. So we, we tend to use more uh, in the winter time, even though we milk less cows, uh, because the winter time creates a lot more issues uh, with milking and things freezing, and it takes a little bit longer to clean. Uh, natural gas usage, usage. Uh, here you can see in the summertime, uh, we use most of it in the wintertime for, for heating our parlor, parlor heat and hot water. And in the summertime, it goes down uh, to about 200 therms per month. Then we sort of swing back up again. Electricity usage, usage uh, these are across the years. Again, you can see it does the same thing. Every year, it seems to spike about November when we turn the space heaters back on, and it, in the spring, it goes down quite considerably, maybe up a little bit more in, in the summertime when we're at full capacity on our cows. So the last few research, uh, sort of some uh, directions we're going. So we've just been approved by uh, uh, LCCMR, and it's been uh, the bill has been signed by the governor. Uh, to look at future dairy energy research. Um, so we're gonna evaluate uh, shade potential using solar systems for our, our pasture cattle. Uh, that will uh, basically look at us being able to field test some electric vehicles out here for, for use in, in dairy production systems by utilizing the solar panels to, to charge the electric vehicle. Uh, we're also gonna put in a smart two-level charging station uh, probably not batteries, but uh, being able to become in the network for uh, fast charging systems. And then we're gonna actually monitor energy and water usage on different dairy farms uh, in the state of Minnesota. To actually look at what's going on in the state, uh, look at different uh, production practices, some with robotic dairies, another smaller pasture-based dairy, and, and some uh, mid-sized dairies as well, to see how we can actually monitor their energy use and 
try and help dairy farmers in Minnesota reduce their, uh, their carbon footprint. So in a sense, this is what we're going to do. Use solar to shade cows. Not cheap, but it's a good picture. Uh, and then uh, basically charge uh, cars and electric vehicles for, for use in dairy production systems. So we thank uh, LCCMR for providing funding uh, for that. And with, with that, I think we'll uh, have any questions. So we'll, and we'll be able to see more of this stuff over, over there when we go on the tour and, and talk about that as well. So thank you. Comment on your space heaters. I think I've probably burned a couple of semi motors in the damn thing in my lifetime. They used to last longer before they started coming from China. But what I did here a couple of years ago is finally went to a hardwired mounted 220 hardwired heater. They've gone on about nothing compared to them space heaters. Space heaters? Well, yeah, well. Probably have to consider that and start looking into something else. So we uh, we we seem to burn up. We probably burned up our fair share of space heaters as well. <laughs> yes. When you gave the averages for hot water usage, yep. you know, what temperature of hot water would be the range? So it, uh, for our hot water, we have to when we're washing the the pipelines, we have to maintain about 160 degrees uh, in in temperature make sure that we sanitize everything and get everything clean. So for the most part, that's what we try and maintain. When we try and run everything at once, we don't maintain 160 degrees. So we're, some of that water is probably at 130 or 140 when we were doing that. Just a quick question, and this may be for all the presenters, but is there, what's the latest science on organic versus the standard as far as uh, health effects and, and all that. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy sometimes people talk about it, but is there a latest science? Is there any, anything that uh, uh, anybody uh, has a handle on? Yes, so, so, so it's, it can be controversial depending on the study. There's a lot of aspects that show organic products are more healthy, uh, for you than, than conventional, but there's also sh research that doesn't show that shows that they're basically the same. I think some of the what uh, more of the organic is trying to go to now is more of a grass-based diet to increase the omega threes in the milk, and you can do that on a conventional grazing system as well as organic. So. I think that's what they're mo moving more towards is grass-based, higher forage diets, a lot less corn and starch. And that you'll see that mostly in the in the organic industry, moving more towards a grass base. So it, I think it's, it certainly depends on the study and, and what you're trying to research. Some of the things that we see here, even based on our uh, <coughs> observations, is our, our crop yields are relatively the same, whether they're organic or, or conventional and we can manage those uh, quite equally. Uh, it just depends what, what the input costs are, and sometimes we do better organically, and sometimes we do better conventionally. It just depends on the year. Yes? Could you talk <coughs> some about the, where, what happens to the hot water after you, when you just go down the drain, what temperature? Um, I'm just curious about <coughs> capturing some of that low grade So the majority of the water that goes down the drain, but into the lagoon, into the manure lagoon. Right. So we're, we, we capture it, uh, but it's probably 100 to 110 degrees uh, when, when it's going down. Uh, so we, we could do some capturing of it. We're not wasting it because that will go on crop grounds or pasture grounds as water, but, right. you're losing heat. but we are losing some heat. Could you have had in the winter time a sort of competing need for heating the space and ventilation? So I've got two questions on that. Have you used any energy recovery ventilation on that at all? The ERV units that we capture uh, from the heat, the center sweeps out of the humidity right. uh, on the exhaust. And you do frequency drives on your vacuum pump. Have you used them on your main? 
frustration on that level? Uh, you have a good question. Uh, the answer is no. You know, we were not recovering any of that heat uh, in lost ventilation. Obviously, it's, some of it is being exhausted out into the into the into the world. And yeah, we're not using any other frequency drives uh, as far as on, on, on those systems as well. Right, for us, this is an opportunity to talk about the age of the dairy and the proposal for the new dairy in the St. Paul area this year. Yes, yeah, so our, our, our facility is, uh, the facility that we'll go into is an old dye style barn. It was built in 1973, I think. So it's a lot of uh, upgrades have happened uh, by putting things in and, and making it work. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a proposal with, and if you want to talk, the, the Dean is here. He probably knows a lot more about it than, than all of us, but there's a proposal to include Morris and St. Paul in a new sort of dairy research facilities uh, at, at both places to upgrade our research capacity and our building needs. Uh, to, and, and here it would include a lot more renewable energy aspect uh, into, into the milking parlor. Here for us, it's just a milking parlor, and in St. Paul, it's a, a lot more facility. Yes, question. So for your electric vehicle um, project that you just got funding for, yes. is that going to be just conventional cars? Are you going to, or pickups? Are you going to have any um, agriculture, you know, farm kinds of vehicle equipment that you? Well, right now, in, in for, for our system, we use a lot of uh, ATVs, so uh, John Deere Gators, that's or Kubotas, that's what we have now uh, for feeding cattle, uh, moving animals, our, our space is quite large here. So we, we use a lot of those for moving animals back and forth between pastures or different things like that. So that's the first thing that we're gonna go to is, is utilizing electric uh, ATVs because we, we put a lot of hours and a lot of uh, fuel through those. Uh, and then we're, we're also, we're gonna get a, a, a electric car, car, an all electric vehicle to uh, at least utilize when we're out monitoring energy on dairies and utilize that for our, our station needs as well. But as far as other things, tractors, those, we, we haven't quite gone down that route yet. We're gonna explore it on a more smaller scale first uh, before we uh, maybe get, get any bigger. Yeah. 